7, verses 1 to 10. And the good news is, after Jesus had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. A centurion there had a slave whom he valued highly and who was ill and close to death. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, asking him to come and heal his slave. When they came to Jesus, they appealed to him earnestly, saying, He is worthy of having you do this for him, for he loves our people, and it is he who built our synagogue for us. And Jesus went with them, but when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself. For I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore I did not presume to come to you, but only speak the word and let my servant be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. Thus ends the reading from Holy Scripture. We ask God to aid us in our living according to it. Would you please be seated? Now, just so you know, I didn't pick the scripture. It's lectionary. It sort of picked me. But what a perfect scripture to have on a day when we honor soldiers. I want to start with a soldier story that has to do with Memorial Day, and then we'll get on to the sermon. It's about an old man and his wife sitting in the parking lot of a supermarket. The hood is up on their car. Evidently, they are having engine trouble. A young man in his early 20s with a grocery bag in his arm walks in the direction of the elderly couple, and the old gentleman emerges from the car and takes a few steps in the young man's direction. He points to the open hood and asks the young man for assistance. The young man puts his grocery bag into his expensive SUV, turns back to the old man and yells at him, you shouldn't even be allowed to drive a car at your age. And then with a wave of his hand, he gets into his car and speeds out of the parking lot. The old gentleman pulls out his handkerchief, mops his brow, and goes back to his car. Again, he looks at the engine. We've all done it, looking, expecting it to do something. Mops his brow, gets back in the car, and he says to his wife, everything is going to be okay. A stranger approaches the old man and he said, looks like you're having a problem. And he says to the old man, who smiles sheepishly and replies simply with a nod of the head. The stranger looks under the hood of the car, but he has no more expertise with automobile engines than the old man. So, no. He assures the gentleman, though, that he will go to the nearby service station, explain the situation to a mechanic, and that he will... Pay him, the mechanic, if he has to, to get him to come. The mechanic heard the story, and he agreed to return, so the stranger gets into a conversation while the mechanic is working on the car. He talks to the old gentleman, and he's wearing a ring signifying that he had been a Marine. And coincidentally, so had the stranger who came up to help. He, the old guy said... And that's my loving term for old people. Don't take it offensively. The old person, the old guy, said that he had served in some of the harshest battles in our nation's history, including Guadalcanal and Okinawa. And when he retired from the Marine Corps, it wasn't until after the war. So once the car was repaired and running, the old gentleman handed a card to the stranger, and they shook hands and parted. A little while later, the stranger looked at the card, and the name of the old gentleman was on the car in gold leaf, and under his name was written, Congressional Medal of Honor Society. 
It was only then that the former re Marine realized that he had come to the aid of one of America's heroes. The story is just a reminder that Memorial Day weekend, that there are men and women who have served their country and receive very little in return. And it's only right that we recognize their sacrifices. Or as Jesus put it, be careful, you might be entertaining angels unaware. In our text today, a Roman soldier's faith takes us inside the nature of faith and shows us how and what faith does. It's not just a word. It has a lot of impact in our lives and especially when we take our own faith seriously. Faith allows God to do for us and with us what we could never have done for ourselves alone. In the passage I read today in the seventh chapter of Luke, we find a centurion who, though he is a Gentile, understood who Christ was and is. It's the story that would be of special interest to Theophilus, which is the person that this greeting was directed to, a Gentile, and to us Gentiles hearing the story today, or it should be. The story is significant because this was a Gentile, a non-Jew, to whom the account is addressed, and to us as the Gentiles hearing the story read today. It was a Gentile who showed amazing faith. It was a Gentile who Jesus would remark on whose faith was amazing. The centurion had amazing faith. The question that comes to me is, why was Jesus so amazed? Here's a person that has amazing faith. That's what Jesus wanted. Why was he amazed? What are the characteristics that made that faith so awesome? To put us into context, Jesus has just completed his teaching known as the Sermon on the Mount. And now Jesus entered into Capernaum, a city on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee, and while Jesus is in Capernaum, he's approached by Jewish elders from that city who come representing this Roman centurion. Centurions were commonplace in the Roman Empire. They were equivalent to the rank of a modern-day army captain and normally in command of 100 soldiers. In this case, they were also the invader and the conqueror of the nation of the Jews. The particular centurion sent a message that he had a servant who was ill and that he knew that Jesus could heal him. And Luke, you remember who's writing this, was also a physician. He says that the servant was sick and ready to die. If you've ever clung to a loved one that was at death's door, and you felt that he or she was slowly losing the battle, you know this centurion's awful sense of helplessness. We're told that this man loved Israel, though it was not the land of his birth. It's also evident that the man cared deeply about the servant, and socially that was way out of ordinary. And he crossed racial and ethnic barriers when he, as a Gentile, appealed to a Jew for help. All we have to do, look around the world today, is to see how extraordinary that was then and still is today. Hearing that Jesus was in the area, the centurion decides to risk his reputation by going to a Jew for help. Now, the second characteristic of an amazing faith is that it caused this man to be excited and active in the work of God. You have someone who's invaded a country, learns about the Jewish Yahweh, and is excited to help, wants to help, puts his money where his mouth is to help. Unusual, to say the least. So when the elders come to him to plead for him, they say that he's an extraordinary example of someone who really loves their nation, loves their people, even loves their God, for he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. The synagogue was the way that the truth about God was getting out, they thought, and so for a foreigner to build a synagogue was unheard of. Now, the elders not only bring the man's request, but they vouch for him. 
they tell Jesus that he's a man of integrity and, and that all the things that he had done to help the people. Verse 3 says, The elders, when they approached Jesus, had said, For he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. That would be akin to Muslims saying, We love your nation. Let us build you houses of worship. Let us build you churches. Let us give to your churches. Take care of your churches. That's how shocking it was. The elders knew that their message was not something that Jesus would have been accustomed to hear. They made sure that Jesus understood the monetary benefit that the Jewish people had gotten for him. He built us a synagogue. In stark contrast, there was a um, survey done by the Barner Group, who lots of church people use as ways to see how well the church itself, Big C, is doing. And it said that the average donation by adults is $17 a week. Now, all of those who give more, going, well, I give more than that. You do, but others give less. And so the average is $17 a month, not even a week, but a month. Hopefully, you give because you're responding in gratitude to the gift that Christ gave us of himself. Hopefully, you see God's wanting to use the church as a way to bring people to Christ. Hopefully, you give because it's the only thing you can do when you think about the enormity of the gift that has been given to you. It wasn't a little gift. It was his whole life. Now, As we remember the example of the centurion, I ask, what is it that God is doing that you are excited about that matters to you that you are enthusiastically giving yourself to? I know some people stayed home this morning because there was a race on TV. Couldn't get away from it. It was on TV. I know some are away with family. And hopefully you're going to church with family wherever they're away, but also to celebrate with picnics and camping and all the other good stuff that comes along with having a long weekend. But what, for God, are we giving ourselves to? That's a question that kind of stays with you if you let it. The third characteristic of an amazing faith was that it caused this man to approach Christ in great humility. Not like, remember the Pharisee, look, I'm so great. Here I am. I'm great. I'm so glad I'm not women. I'm not these people over here. I'm me. And look how much I give. And Jesus said, go into a closet and pray, not stand out front. This guy had a lot of humility. First, he won't even come to Jesus. He sends somebody first to him. And then when Jesus is almost there, he says, Hmm, don't come to my house. I know what that means for a Jewish rabbi to come into a Gentile house. Don't do that. You don't have to. I have faith that you can simply say, Be well, and my servant will be well. Wow. The soldier, unlike the Pharisees, does not ask Jesus for a sign that he was who he said he was. He simply knows. And the fourth characteristic of an amazing face, faith was that it caused this man to be willing to trust in Christ alone. We say we trust in God. We say we trust in faith alone. We say, we say, we say. But he did it. He's the... One who said, um, I'm a man placed under authority. I know what it's like to have soldiers under me. When I say something, tell them to do it, they do it. So that's all you have to do. Use the authority. What authority? Authority given from God. Authority only the Christ would be able to have. That's kind of awesome that somebody not even part of the faith recognized Christ 
not having heard him, it doesn't say he ever saw Jesus, just that he heard of him. Remember that passage in Thomas where it said, Blessed are those who believe yet have not seen? That's the centurion. He hadn't seen. He had only heard. And he believed. The word also in verse 8, we see that the officer saw a parallel between the way he commanded his soldiers and the way Jesus commanded diseases. I have soldiers. They do what I tell them. You have power over these diseases. They will do what you tell them. Isn't it awfully hard for us to be that full of faith when we're sick? God's in charge and it will be taken care of. It's hard. Jesus says, I say to you, I have not found such great faith. Not even in Israel. Not even in the church. Not even in those who call themselves followers have I found such great faith. The man's remarks amazed Jesus as well they should. First of all, remember they came from a Gentile. And then remember that he was so humble he didn't even want Jesus to set his feet inside what would have been a profane space for a Jewish person. He was hated by the Jews because he was a Roman and an invader of that nation. Yet instead of condemning him here, Jesus says, the greatest faith that I have come across, even not in Israel. These things that startled and impressed Jesus were the characteristics that we can have in our lives if we want them. Some think that an amazing faith is the ability to do miraculous things. That's not it at all. Miracles are something that Jesus does anytime. But faithful, godly lives are what gets Christ's attention anytime. Elsewhere in Scripture, we're told that only a mustard seed of faith, I can't even make the little hole there small enough, even a mustard seed of faith is all we need to move mountains, to do miraculous things. Our question becomes, not only I hope for this week, but for all the time, what do I do with the faith I've been given? Does the way I live my life all week long, not just at church on Sunday, show to the world the person of faith that I am? If you leave here and somebody cuts you off and you make gestures and say nasty things, it doesn't say much about your faith. And then finally, can my faith amaze Jesus? Does what I do with my faith make our Lord go, Oh my goodness, look at her. Look at him. Look at that kid. Those are the questions we need to ask and answer. With God's help, so be it. Amen.